ES Audio. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio. Six Nations Special. Hello, I'm Lawrence Delalio. Welcome to the Evening Standard Rugby Podcast in partnership with Eden Park. As ever, joining me for the Evening Standard is Steve Cording. Hi, Steve. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Very well, thank you. And rugby correspondent Nick Bruwell. Hello, Nick. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Probably feeling like you, really. Uh, I mean, I had to talk about it. You had to write about it, but we'll talk about that later. And our special guest, uh, 39 caps as fly half for his home nation, Argentina, between 1996 and 2003. He spent eight years playing club rugby all over France with Narbonne, Bézier, Stade Francais, Po, and Toulon. And he loved the country so much that once he retired from playing, he coached with the national team, Racing, and he's still there currently coaching Stade Francais. It's head coach Gonzalo Casada. How are you, Gonzalo? Hi, Lawrence. Nice. Thank you for the presentation. All good. Happy to be here, too. Well, listen, thank you as well, because I understand you've just come back from your holiday. Were you sitting on the beach or were you? Uh, was your mind constantly working as to uh, the next week's match and the week after? You know, man, as a player, as a coach, uh, it's all about negotiation with our wives. So it was a, a real holiday. But every morning I, I had uh, one hour for some training or just a bit of exercise and uh, a couple of hours uh, with a computer but that's all the rest of the time i, I relax and i spend time with my wife that was the the big plan and to get out of the cold paris too yeah in the middle of a really long and tough season so it's good for the heads and uh, for the interest of my staff and my players it was a good thing that i cut off and i get away i i relax a bit and i come fresh back yeah absolutely well listen where, where were you by the way in uh, mauritius did i hear you say yeah, in Mauritius, it was good fun there, yeah. Steve, not quite so glamorous weekend for you. Yeah, it was the old birthday parties again. However, I've made a fantastic discovery in my local neck of the woods in Surbiton. One of the parties was at the Royal British Legion. Now, straight away, I know you've got images there of old war heroes and stories, but it wasn't anything like that. Big screens, sport, no wives and cheap beer and it's 42 pound a year to join and i'm going to take that up straight away so big shout out to them for looking after us but that was a perfect discovery for this weekend and nick obviously we'll get on to the rugby shortly but are you reporting at the weekend or did you manage to, to build a bit of time off yeah i had a, something approaching day off yesterday which was quite nice yeah just sort of uh, took the dogs out got them on the beach and, and stuff like that they're not brave enough to get in the water but <laughs> they'll have a bark at it so and Lawrence, what about you? I, I heard you uh, talking about media launches. Uh, Alan Brazil and Chris Evans, both in the same morning? Yes, well, I uh, did some filming in Italy throughout the summer, uh, and the show is called Live Italian, and it dropped on Friday on uh, Amazon Prime or Amazon TV. It's about going back to Italy and connecting with your roots. Of course, I'm half Italian. The premise of the show is that, you know, I live life very quickly in London, so they introduced me back to Italy and I need to slow down and the man that they gave me to slow down was Martin Castro Giovanni, who Cusada will know very well. He's been on the show and uh, he's a star of Italian TV because he's a reality TV star. Uh, and we did a series of challenges around uh, Italy. And then the loser had to uh, had to cook for the winning team. So Castro is used to getting the wooden spoon. So he did the <laughs> it was uh, It was a fantastic five days. And uh, as we all know, a uh, fantastic uh, country. But uh, yeah. There's three episodes, one with Jack Whitehall, one with Maya Jammer, and one with Lawrence Delalio. So we'll see who gets the most views, shall we? Wooden Spoon's not quite the segue into the rugby, but we're not far off. At least England can't get that. But we, we've got to start by talking about the weekend and the rugby, round four of the Six Nations, starting at Twickenham. Nothing that any of us really could foresee. A record defeat, 53-10 by France. The reaction, to say the least, has been pretty fierce. I don't know if you saw the tweet from Steve Thompson, who said the players were stealing a living. 48 hours on, Lawrence. Well, was this the case of England being so bad, or were France's players, as the uh, emotional Fabien Galtier said afterwards, producing a Le match of the tournament? Well, I don't know. The match of the tournament tends to be one where two teams are taking part, doesn't it, really? Uh, I wouldn't say that was the match of the tournament because there was only one team taking part in that. Uh, it was a massacre, really. France were outstanding. We knew before the game that England were a, a long way away from France. I think we now know after the game exactly how far away they are. France, in the last uh, two years, they've lost one test match. Uh, they've won 14 test matches. They are the current Grand Slam champions and they have six or seven world-class players in their team. If 
those world class players decide to turn up at the same time on the same pitch, then you know you're up against a formidable side. But I mean, they had real class all over the pitch, and you know it's a half and a half, isn't it? France played very very well. England, I mean, I, I'm disappointed really because you know you're playing against a very worthy opponent. Uh, you know that Sean Edwards, the coach, has them in the right mindset. He's he's won so many trophies at that stadium. He understands it inside out. And to concede a try after two minutes, you know, is a, is a worry, really. So, yeah, it was painful viewing, but I'm not surprised. Maybe by the scoreline, but not by the fact that England lost. I mean, Gonzalo, a lot has been made of um, the problems in English rugby at the moment, going from top to bottom. And uh, obviously, we've been watching the Premiership this year, and we've been uh, astounded by some of the fantastic play and the results. But you've got a league there where Northampton can concede 60 points one week and then can score 40 points the next week. I mean, is the foundation for the French team coming out of the top 14, where obviously you work, and is arguably the best league in Europe at the moment? Yeah, it's a long debate. I think on one side, the great thing that happened in French rugby several years ago is this, uh, you know, about the GIF rule, the players, uh, an average of more than 16 players must be French on the 23 every week. I think that rule that has been several years now allowed a lot of young kids to have game time, forced the French clubs to work on their academies to have their own French players and not needing to go outside to other parts of the world. And I think that's a good thing. But I think there's a lot of reasons that makes France playing so good. Of course, this generation, that is an amazing one. This Six Nations was not the best uh, for them still because the, the first game against Italy was quite average. Then they lost logically against an excellent Ireland. Against Scotland, there was good and not good. But what happened this week too is that while you were talking about Farrell or Smith, uh, in France there were some critics for the first time in three years uh, about uh, the way they were playing, if they were playing like this, why these players were playing. or And you know, suddenly... The French team was in the best play. Uh, they love being a bit underdogs, not being favourites in a crunch in Twickenham. So I think all the ingredients were there for an amazing game. Couldn't agree more. I mean, Gonzalo, a couple of questions from me. The, the World Cup is six months away in France. There is obviously a real sense of expectation. There's obviously pressure as well that comes with playing in your own country. You know, you see yourself on the billboards everywhere. You know, the players have to cope with that. Do you see them being in the final in October? I mean, the first game, just for everyone, September the 8th, France against New Zealand. I mean, wow. I mean, what, a, what an opening game. So France, you know, do you see them in the final? And secondly, we have to talk about Argentina, um, who are going under the radar a little bit. But uh, I think they're building nicely towards the World Cup as well. Yeah, I think uh, we can talk hours about France, but um, I think they could be champions or in the final. One of the main reasons it could happen, what France has is every team will have injuries. And as you know, to be champion, you need to win at least three huge games in a row. And not every team is ready for that. You guys in 2003, you you had the, the team to do it. Some teams have. I don't know if Ireland, the best rugby that you, we can see today, I don't know if, if they lose uh, two players per position in some key positions, if they are ready for that and to win like maybe four games in a row every week. France, this weekend, Antonio was out, uh, was, was out and Aldeguerre went came in. And the scrum of France was part of the main reasons why they beat uh, England. So the third right prop that happened to come. I think Francois Cross, no one sees him. I'm sure, Laurence, you do, but not other specialists don't see him. And he's so important. And also, Jelonch is injured. Some other uh, players are not there. And the third or uh, any option. And I think there's so many good players in key positions that injuries will happen to everyone. And France will always have a good team. And I think they are preparing themselves for three years to play several high-intensity games in a row. And that's the only way you can be a champion. I think you're absolutely right. And, and they also have some seriously big men. They won the breakdown, hands down, at Twickenham on Saturday because when they get over the ball, whether it's Dante, whether it's the back row, you know, you can't get them off the ball. So talk to me then. France have got a great chance. What chance Argentina? What, 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 how do you think your old team are going to do and how are they, how they looking? I think uh, the challenge would be that in some 
key positions, maybe the, the options of world-class uh, players is not as big as other opponents. But I think there's a really interesting opportunity for Argentina. The main leaders were super young. They started playing super young international rugby with super rugby first with Jaguares and, and with the Pumas. So the main leaders like Julian Montoya, Pablo Matera, Guido Petty, or uh, I can keep on going, man, they are still quite young, just before their 30s. Again, I, I remember when in Engl England 2003, the, everyone was around their 30s with a great experience, but with still in the best of their career. And uh, I think there's a really good staff too with Michael Cheka at the head with a, a, a really good bunch of coaches. The energy is amazing. I think the key game will be obviously against England. Which is first on the September the 9th. Do you think England and Nick should start focusing on on that game and forget about Ireland. I mean, you, you've written tonight, obviously, in the Evening Standard, that we've now lost Orly Lawrence to injury as well for that game and probably going to turn back to Manu Tuolagi and, dare we actually say it, the smith farrell axis. Well, no, there's more chance. I think there's more chance of Ford farrell Tuolangi. You do? Than smith. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you have a heavy, heavy defeat, I mean, obviously, that was painful at the weekend, but the mentality of these players now is that they have to bounce back. I mean... I was in commentary. I didn't mention Mara Toji's name at all in commentary. Alex Dobran, I mentioned once when he caught the kickoff and he got turned over. You know, it was men against boys. And if you've got aspirations of being an, an international rugby player, you know, when things get tough, you you know, you, you need to respond. And no one's expecting England to win, but, I, but I'd expect a big response from that team, no matter who they put out, because, you know, they were undressed at the weekend by a French side. And you can blame Marcus Smith all you like, but, you know, from one to eight, they need to have a serious meeting with themselves and, uh, and discuss uh, why they're playing rugby. England are struggling for any kind of structure in that, that game. Defensively, they were all over the place. They lost their ruck speed and France completely took advantage of that. Brought them into sort of blind alleys and uh, their desperation to, to push for quick ball. France were much cleverer at the breakdown, as Lawrence was saying. And, um, and actually the way that uh, even Gael Fuku, for example, the way his breakdown defence was phenomenal. England are light years away from that. Steve Borthwick and, and Kevin Sinfield have talked about clarity being their main watchword, but there was none of it at all. And they've had enough time for them to have a basic structure in place. And, and it, it looks like it's got worse that week. They look like they'd made some progress previously against bad opposition. That's being blunt. Borthwick says they know where they are, but they should have known where they were anyway. So it's time to put that sort of talk aside. And where they are isn't Steve Borthwick's fault, but he carries the count for what happens next. Yeah, absolutely. But there were some very experienced players in that England team. I mean, Mario is 28 years of age, 65 caps. He's won everything domestically. You know, people like him, Jamie George, you know, there's there's a, there's some experience there. They need to stand up and uh, and lead this team. It's about self-respect now. Do you stick with those players then this weekend, Lawrence? Do you keep them? Well, listen, I mean, I'd rather get the coach's view. It's maybe different when it's your country to when it is your club. I mean, these are all very talented players. I'd be fascinated... Uh, Gonzalo, to, you know, as a coach, how do you recover in less than a few days and, and get them when you're playing an even better side the following week? No, I think, honestly, it, it will sound weird, but I think uh, World Cup-wise, it's uh, really good news for England. Because as you said, now, thanks to this uh, result, maybe, if you try to, that's how I would see it as a coach. I will never say, I, I will not be sleeping for a couple of days, but I think that the pressure will not be that big for the World Cup, but on the other side, they know all the things they need to work on. The standards of, of every detail for Ireland is not about strategy, if Marcus Smith or Warren Farrell, or I, it's, it's, it's not, the key will not be there. It will be, first of all, a test of knowing what kind of group they have. I think they will know what kind of links they have between the players, how strong is the group, how, how strong is the commitment they all have to each other. And I'm sure that there's going to be a huge response uh, against Ireland and uh, it will be another team, a new team, a week. We always say that a week is a long week. And uh, in this kind, when you have the, so much talent, I'm outside. I don't know a lot of details, but I can bet whatever you want that I don't know if they're going to win, but it's going to be a new English team because there's a lot of characters that you have. As you said, all the, the guys that Farrell, I told you, you can, you can put all those names. They are used to this kind of level and they will react. The English team will be so focused now. The level of commitment, the starters of training, I think everything, you know, everything that was a bit precise will be highly precision. Every weight session, every video session, the participation of the players during the week, they are 
hurt uh, in their pride. So now if you were not sure that Lawrence, you were my coach and you were telling me, ah, we, I think you should be doing this or using this line out or exiting like this. And I was not sure I will come and tell it to you and I will take responsibility for that. So all those little things will change and uh, from this weekend. And I think it will help them a lot for building the World Cup and it will be, they will be ready for the World Cup. And I, I, I have no doubts. I think that's a totally fair comment. And by then, Borthwick will have his full coaching team, which has been a problem because he's only got half of it now. And, you know, it, he can't put all of his ideas in the way he wants them to. And he can't do his sole job because he's having to do other other elements. And, um, and I think attack is is one key key element there. But um, Ireland and, and France, one of the things they've obviously built, what they do on is, is attacking in ways, timing, and everything's about timing and, and everything is so precise. But England are so far away from that. That's probably the biggest surprise because there's no real reason for them to be, like we say, because these are all experienced players who know what they're doing. Now, just got to hope that when they have that time, they can put these building blocks into place and build these systems that the best teams in the world have at the moment that England just don't. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Six Nations Special. Let's look at the other results. And um, obviously this weekend, great win, as you predicted for Wales in Rome. Um, Lawrence, uh, inspired by the returning Reese Webb, um, how well do you think the Welsh played? And is that something for them to build on? There's only ever two emotions in rugby, agony or ecstasy. You know, Wales were in agony after, you know, losing and... They've had a they've had a bad couple of months, haven't they? In the whole build up, and Italy, even though they lost, you know, all the talk in, in the Italian papers and all the rugby news was about how good they are. And I think sometimes the, the Italian captain himself, after the match, he said we were all focused on the results, we didn't focus on our performance. And he said we we were inaccurate. I think when you have Wales having negotiations with your uh, with your union about money, it's never easy negotiation. But uh, it becomes even harder if you lose to Italy. So I think there's a lot of Big reputations in that Wales team. Warren Gatlin, the coach. Alan Wynne-Jones, Tipperick. You know, these are, are guys who have been playing at the highest level for years. Listen, it, it was a good result. 22 points to three at half time. I think the game was done and dusted. And uh, Wales are not as bad as people think they are. In Warren Gatlin, they've got a, a man who's a serial winner. He's, he wins trophies. And I'm sure he'll get them smiling again pretty mm. soon. And, and next up, England obviously is at Ireland, and they came through their test against Scotland with a 22 to seven victory. I mean, Gonzalo, Johnny Sexton, now the joint leading scorer in the all time of the Six Nations, is clearly is he the best fly half in world rugby at the moment? Is he the best fly half of all time? Of course, um, he can be part of the in the discussion and the debate because uh, one thing is to be a, a great number ten during three, four, five seasons. But when you achieve what you are, he's achieving over the years, and it's not of lack of competition because some really talented number tens appeared in the meantime. Personally, I I don't think today's is the best of all times. I think uh, Dan Carter was definitely the the, the best number ten of of all times because he was the most complete uh, number 10 ever. But I think uh, what Sexton has that makes him really different is, uh, is his head. He's uh, one of the biggest competitors on, on the game. He's like, I think, like Owen Farrell in England or those kind of players that pushes the performance around them, pushes everyone around them to be at their best. Yeah, I'm I'm going to go actually with a, an Irishman for, we're going to do player of the weekend and definitely you're going to go for... Mac Hansen is my player of the weekend. Lawrence, who's your player of the weekend? Um, well, I mean, it has to be a Frenchman, really. Um, I'm going to go with the Richard Hill of French rugby, Francois Cross. Nick, your player of the weekend? Kean Healy, because he ended up playing hooker and they had contested scrums. And you talk about dealing with problems and setbacks. Unbelievable. Can I just say, on the on that game, it looks bad for Scotland because the, the scoreline is, what, 22-7. But actually, the first half, Scotland had a lot of opportunities to put Ireland under pressure, you know, to score tries. And they just, they got a little bit overexcited. Every time they got close to the try line, they, they kind of almost tried to do it all too quickly, you know. And we know that, that attacking and scoring tries is not easy in rugby. You need to have that, you know, calmness under pressure, particularly when you get close to the line. Because, you know, again, France, every time they got in the England 22, they scored points. 
Scotland did more than enough to win that game. And they'll reflect on that and they'll look at it and go, we could have made some different decisions. And they will play Ireland again in the World Cup because they're in the same group, aren't they? You know, mark my words, Ireland are the best team in the world at the moment, but Scotland will, will come back at them and they'll think differently when they play them in the World Cup. Yeah, Gonzalo, are you going to go for a Frenchman as your player of the weekend? Yeah, yeah. Um, Lauren stole, uh, stole my idea. <laughs> Obviously, um, Dupont, uh, Ramos... Aldrit, they all were amazing, but I like to put the lights uh, on those who we see less. And uh, that's why I, in a previous uh, question, I talked about Cross and Aldegheri because they were not supposed to play. They were not in the plans without injuries and they allowed the French stars, the full of talent players to do what they did. So uh, well, uh, I will stay with them too. Okay, let's look ahead then to the Super Saturday, the final round of matches that we've got. One word answers from all of you on this one as to who's going to win. First up then, we will have Scotland against Italy. Nick? Scotland. Lawrence? Uh, Scotland. Gonzalo? I would love Italians to have a win, but I think it will be Scotland and they are, they will, I think it will be a, by a big difference. And then we've got uh, France against Wales in Paris. Uh, Gonzalo, is that going to be another win for France? It would be another win for France, but in the same way I say England will have a different performance against Ireland. It will be a big challenge also for France, but I think uh, it will be a, a, a big win for France again, especially because I think uh, Wales won't be able to match the set piece and the consequence will be hard for Wales, I think. Yeah, do you see the same thing, Lawrence? Yeah, France, I mean, you know, one of the best sides in the world. You don't lose at home six months before the World Cup to anyone. They're low Wales, so uh, France... Agreed, Nick? 100%. So we're, we're, we're concurring there on everything until we get to the big one. So the final game over in Dublin, um, I imagine you're all going to say the same thing here as well. Ireland against England. We'll start with Nick. Yeah, Ireland. I think by about 15, actually. 15? Ooh, not too bad. Lawrence? Well, they're... We're yet to see the teams announced. There's a lot of injury uh, situations in Ireland. There's a lot of injury situations in England. England aren't as bad as they sh as they showed everyone at Twickenham, but there's, there are fundamental flaws in their game. And, and Ireland are at a much different level at the moment. So uh, you can't fix those problems in, in one week, trust me. I think England will, uh, will, will have uh, a much better performance. They better do, otherwise they can find other jobs to do. Uh, and, you, and you'll be there watching it. Who are you going to have on COCOMs this weekend? Are you? Uh, oh, I think I think it'll be Gordon Darcy. But he may as well just have one microphone, and I'll I'll go and sit down and have and make make the coffee for everyone else to be honest. <laughs> Gonzalo, uh, only one winner in that game. Yeah, I think uh, Alan will will win. Uh, it's tough to imagine, uh, in, as uh, as Laurent said, even if they, it will be another attitude, or England will be another team. And the, the Pride will be the biggest weapon on that game. So I imagine a, a short score, not a big gap, but uh, too tough. I don't see which, which weapons can England have to beat Ireland in Ireland uh, the day of their Grand Slam opportunity. Well, now it's time for the one part of the show that all our guests look forward to. Uh, Gonzalo, you're about to get tackled by Lawrence Delalio. Tackled. Gonzalo, just a few questions, which we ask all of our uh, special guests. Your full name, please. Something very uh, dramatic and uh, glamorous, I should imagine. Not super original. Uh, I don't have a second name, so it's Gonzalo Quesada. Spanish basic. And uh, what do you have for breakfast when you're not on holiday in Mauritius? Well, when you're living in France, obviously, uh, what would you eat for breakfast? Ah, okay, yeah. Today's breakfast was an artificial thing that you have in a plane that's supposed to be food, but you keep on trying to find the taste and it's like you're eating paper and plastic. But in general, um, we are lucky. Uh, I have a, quite a healthy breakfast in the club. Uh, in general, I try to do an omelette. And uh, a really good omelette done by Pascal is the name of our cook. It's an amazing one. Some avocado. My wife tells me to eat, eat avocado, so I do it too. And then I eat, drink too much coffee. I drink uh, uh, liters and liters of coffee. Now tell me, the, uh, the best advice that you've been given, either in rugby or outside, is it from your parents, from a coach? Let's say uh, a couple of things come to my head. The one that I liked is uh, from my father that was also a coach and he's a successful businessman. And uh, he pushed me. I studied something else. I, I have an, a university degree, a business administration, economics, nothing to do with the 
coaching. Then I started studying coaching. But he gave me an advice to do a lot of uh, studies and have a degree in sports psychology, especially to make sure that I changed my chip from player to coach if I wanted to be a good coach. So those studies in psychology, I think they changed uh, my whole vision. So that's the best advice as I have. And I'm enjoying my coaching a lot because of that. And um, then a friend told me when I was quite young, uh, never stop drinking water while you're getting on the piss. Not to get there. <laughs> <laughs> that, my friend, is a very good bit of advice. Honestly, and uh, when I was really young, I, I got drunk a couple of times. Uh, and on my 20s, they gave me that, and that changed my life. I don't drink that much. Steve, you need to listen to that. In fact, Lawrence gave me exactly the same advice when we were out drinking last Wednesday night, but he left early and I stayed and I didn't have any water. As producer Jules will testify, we were still there drinking and there was no water in sight. Big mistake. <laughs> well, listen, that is sound advice on the pitch and off the pitch. Uh, Gonzalo, who is the most famous person in your phone book? I don't have a lot of uh, actors or celebrities. Uh, I'm uh, a good friend of Didier Deschamps, the French football coach. He's the only one I think I can say that you will know. Yeah, yeah. Won, won a World Cup as a player and a manager. Yes, yes. I, I, I get along really well with him. Good man. And they did a film of Gonzalo Cusada. Who would you like to, who would you see as the actor who would play you? Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, I liked it. when I was younger. I I would like to say uh, Kevin Costner, like some because someone told me when I was young yeah, something like that. I hopefully not Mr. Bean or but uh, <laughs> that's me. I'm Mr. Bean. <laughs> and I would love it. honestly Will Ferrell. I I'm a that's big fan of Will Ferrell, but I don't know if I would be proud of the film. But I I, I would love <laughs> if it's him. I'm sure that we will be a success. Who is the funniest person uh, that you know? Is it someone that you played with? when you were playing rugby or is it someone in your club environment now? No, oh, there's a hundred ga- a hundred names that come, but uh, to make it interesting for you because uh, you're in England is uh, Agustin Crevy. I don't know if you had a chance of doing do a podcast with him. He loves it. Uh, he's uh, I coached him two years in Jaguares and he's extremely, extremely funny. No, he's a good man. Uh, if you have to sing a song, I'd imagine you're probably very, very musical, but uh, when you sing a song on the Argentina bus, what would you sing? Yeah, no, karaoke song. I, the only one I know the lyrics is when I was a kid, I, I was uh, had those all the groups that everyone liked in, in the 80s, 90s. Uh, but it's uh, Summer of 69. That's the only one I can sing uh, that I knew the lyrics. I, I don't know. You play to an audience here. You get the, we're all very nostalgic in this arena. We're, we're, all, we're, all, we're all of the same age. So I was going to say, yeah. you mean you mean old, not nostalgic. Now. <laughs> yeah. the, the two important questions, uh, which we ask all of our guests, the best rugby player of all time. They think the most talented player that I ever saw is Christian Kulen. It's not a name that comes all the time. I think he he didn't like a lot of the media and he's always a low profile. I don't know the guy at all. I never talked to him, but I think he he was the most talented, the most gifted player that played rugby. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you'll see his top 20 tries. You'll, you'll see what Casado is talking about. He's unbelievable. And... Final question. You personally, your most memorable rugby moment in your career, whether it's playing or coaching, what would you say? You've had many highlights, so it's difficult to, to give us one. No, as you said, I have a lot of uh, club rugby uh, as a coach, uh, being champion or whatever. But I was just playing rugby, amateur rugby, but playing for the Pumas already since 96. That's when we played against you. But when we arrived to 99 World Cup, we had the luck of being amateur team, playing the opening game in the Millennium Stadium. That was maybe the first or second time that stadium was going. So we were a bunch of Argentinian students playing rugby and training super hard and opening the 99 World Cup. So the whole scene from the hotel in Cardiff going across the Red Sea of people that was, because uh, of course they were, there were no cars. We were going through the people until the stadium and the ambience. There were like 1,000 Argentinians and 79,000 uh, Welshmen there. So it was uh, one of the biggest experiences of my life. And you won that game, right? We didn't. We we were on the game all game. And uh, if we have uh, another half an hour, we will talk about <laughs> a, a try that uh, made us lose today would be never accorded they step one meter outside the pitch and the inside pass Colin Charvis scored and we lost by this five or six points that game was incredible 
Well, listen, Gonzalo, thank you for being tackled uh, and thank you for being our guest this week, especially as you've rushed back from holiday. We wish you all the very best with Stade Francais, with the run-up to the season. I know you've got a big game coming up against Racing, so good luck with that and making the playoffs and winning the top 14. That's all for this podcast. Thanks to Steve, of course, and to Nick, and a special thanks to Eden Park. Make sure you don't miss our final Six Nations podcast next week. Until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Six Nations Special.